Hey, it's Mike here, and today, does refined sugar cause cancer? Donde esta azúcar causa cancer? That was not correct. Should it be added to the WHO's list of carcinogens? I just recently was covering that, looking at red meat in response to Peter Atia, and I thought, hmm, it seems like lower down on this list at least, maybe refined sugar should be on there. I mean, I've heard so much about the connection. What about that whole sugar feeds tumors idea? So we're gonna take a look at the research, and I would like to say I'm a pretty unbiased researcher on this topic, especially because you know I tend to dodge processed foods in general, but I also understand that sugar is delicious. That being said, going into researching this, I was expecting to find quite a bit of a connection here, to be honest, but I was surprised looking at the research, especially with some newer research about, you know, what is fueling cancer, how much sugar is it gobbling, and that led me to be like, holy crap, I was not expecting it to be this nuanced, etc. so let's just get right into it. Right off the bat, I need to emphasize that we are talking about refined sugars, oftentimes table sugar, which is glucose plus fructose, you know, this is white powder, or, you know, if it's added to liquid, suspended white powder. But that is very different from whole carbs, which over and over again are associated with lower mortality, lower cancer, etc. And I had a feeling that this video might attract people that are just afraid of carbs, period. And because of that, I need to mention that people who completely are trying to dodge carbs, people on low carb diets from meta-analyses like this one, have 30% increased all-cause mortality. So wholesale dodging carbs doesn't appear to be a good strategy for living long, but I will say the plant-based low-carb diets have decreased mortality in studies. Now, I should mention that the WHO at least has a whole spectrum of carcinogens. You got that class one, which includes alcohol, which I feel like most people aren't aware of or would not want to be aware of, and that also includes processed meat and things like plutonium. And that's based on certainty of connection, not the magnitude of the connection, but then we also have class 2A and 2B, which is probable carcinogens, including unprocessed red meat, as well as night shift work, hot beverage consumption, which I thought was really interesting, and then 2B is possible carcinogen, which is a lot of random chemicals, DDT, which is a pesticide, as well as like asphalt, gasoline, tissue implants, and carpentry. I'm assuming that's the dust exposure. And so it's just good to keep that in mind. And then it's also good to keep in mind that causality has a pretty high bar and it's very different from association. You know, the classic example of how ashtrays would be highly associated with cancer, but it's really the cigarettes and smoking that is causing that cancer. And one thing that helps determine this is the Bradford Hill criteria. I recently went through all of these different points with red meat and the research in a previous video, but you know, we're talking about things like, is it plausible? Is there a consistent connection? Etc. So now that you have those basics, which we will go into more, we can ask the question, you know, is there some plausible connection here? And I think most people would go back to that. Yeah, well, sugar, I'm told, feeds cancer. And in fact, many people will cite the figure that tumors consume like 50 to 100 times as much glucose as normal healthy surrounding cells. And I honestly accepted this idea, but you know me, if I'm gonna make a claim, I need to have that research right there. And I kept on digging like, okay, what's the research behind this? Oh, well, that's a dead end right there. I wasn't finding original research. And that's where things got a little bit complicated because there are things like our natural killer cells, part of our immune system, that preferentially do feed off glucose and those seek out, find cancer and kill it. And to even more of my surprise, newer research is just challenging this even further from a research team at Vanderbilt University. They looked at six different types of cancer and they radioactively traced, you know, glucose and other potential forms of fuel for these tumors. They say, yeah, in scans you can see tumors light up, but it's not every single cell within a tumor area that is cancerous. We also have immune cells, for example, and the results were that the immune cells were actually the ones that were gobbling up that glucose to fight the tumor, while the tumors were preferentially eating fatty acids and the amino acid glutamine. According to Jeffrey Rathmull of Vanderbilt, he said, quote, we now know that tumors include many types of cells, and it's surprising that non-cancer cells are actually the major glucose consumers in the tumor. Now that blew my mind, and it got me thinking, even for the sake of argument, if these tumor cells were sucking up all that glucose or really were relying on a lot of glucose. 
our body maintains glucose homeostasis anyway. Yeah, we get some blood sugar spikes that might last 45 minutes or whatever, but our body is still going to have a reservoir of glucose in our blood that cancer could draw from. I think a good analogy is that like if our blood is represented by a pool, our body wants to keep that water level in the pool at a minimum level you know, of about 70 milligrams per deciliter of glucose. Anything below that is hypoglycemia, where you can have a ton of negative side effects from dizziness to seizures. And so if cancer is represented by like a hole in the lining of the pool drinking glucose, like our body is just gonna keep filling up that glucose pool anyway and still giving it fuel. And then for the last point here, people might be like, oh, I'm so afraid of fueling cancer with sugar that I'm gonna go on a ketogenic diet, I'm gonna run on ketones and everything is gonna be great, starving cancer. Well, I have looked around and there are claims on the internet that tumors can't use ketones as fuel. But that just appears to be wrong from this study. Administration of a ketone body increased tumor growth by two and a half fold. And we'll hop to sugar intake research in a second here, but there's still more to look at in terms of elevated blood glucose itself potentially causing cancer. And yeah, there are studies like this one showing that at higher fasting blood glucose was associated with 30% increased cancer risk, which you would think would be a little bit higher, but hey, what's going on here? Could there be a connection? And as this flow chart shows, there are various ways that high blood glucose could be causing cancer. A lot of these are really indirect, but one, for example, is increased oxidative stress, which as we know, increases DNA damage, etc. But again, that's just a potential way. And I couldn't help but think of metformin, which is a diabetes drug, which down regulates your blood glucose. And yeah, from this study, studies have shown that metformin reduces the incidence of cancer by 30 to 50%. Holy crap, is that just because it's lowering blood glucose? Well, no, they say the main pathway here actually has to do with downregulating mTOR, a major pathway of disease and aging, and actually starving tumor cells of protein. But the lower glucose itself lowers mTOR, so, you know, it's convoluted. So no clear answer there. And I would add that you can elevate blood glucose not just by eating sugar. In fact, that fasting blood glucose itself is likely not from sugar that you just ate. It's from insulin resistance, which has a slew of causes all the way to fat within the muscle cell from excess saturated fat consumption. Heck, years back, didn't carnivore dieter Sean Baker even have diabetic fasting blood glucose levels on his like zero carb diet, which of course can be from eating too much protein in your body, doing gluconeogenesis, creating a new sugar. So let's just get to the sugar intake research. Well, we have this massive review that looked at a bunch of different studies and I really was expecting there to be more of a connection here, honestly. But yeah, most studies didn't find a connection, which blew my mind because you would think even just eating more sugar would probably have so many other bad habits with it that we would see a more powerful signal. And it doesn't look like big sugar at work here. You know, they're funded generally by either the NIH, things like the Danish Cancer Society, organizations like that. And here's another study. They say solid sugar, like table sugar, wasn't associated with increased risk of all cancers combined, but they did find a 20% increased risk for liquid glucose intake. So we're getting signals of yes, we're getting signals of no, which is a little frustrating, but there is one cancer that appears to stick out more than others, and that is breast cancer. Well, it is the case in that previous review, not every study was showing an association with breast cancer. Uh, this is one that is the most convincing of any of them. If there is a connection because while some studies might show maybe a 20% increased risk, others like this one out of Malaysia are showing an approximately 200% risk, twice the risk. And breast cancer appears to break away from the pack from this French study from 2020 on 100,000 people. While total sugar consumption was associated with a 17% increased risk and table sugar was associated with a 30% increased risk of all cancers, Breast cancer and total sugar consumption had a stronger relationship with a 50% increased risk. And in terms of the Bradford Hill criteria, one of them is biological gradient, and we can see that very clearly here, a stepwise relationship with more sugar and more breast cancer. Just totally interesting side note, though fructose in particular was associated with a lower risk when it went higher, and I think that that's 
particular to this being a European study where people are probably eating fruit. And we do see in other studies that fruit consumption is associated with lower risk of various cancers like this one. But the breast cancer connection continues from this study looking at women under 45. In particular, they had nearly two and a half times the risk of breast cancer, which is wild. And I think what might be going on here is just the difference in how people are adjusting for BMI. We know that obesity is heavily connected to cancers and honestly, could even be considered a cause of cancer because it increases hormonal signaling, which boosts cancer and tumor growth, et cetera. So while well, excess sugar consumption could contribute to obesity, which is causing it, that could be adjusted out here possibly unfairly, but this study on these younger women found no change while adjusting for BMI. The relationship still held strong. It might've been how much they adjusted for it. But again, we're getting a lot of things going on here. And at this point, I have to remind us that we're still just talking about association here. We're not talking about causation. However, we definitely need to have the association to build upon. So the question is, is there any mechanism that might be sticking here? And we really need more research on this. But one answer could be 12 locks, the magic formula that allowed Rapunzel to grow her hair so long. No, it's actually 12 lipoxygenase. And this study, unfortunately on mice, you know I hate mouse studies as much as the next person, but they fed mice table sugar or starch and the table sugar ones had increased tumor size and tumor spreading. And they hypothesize here, quote, that dietary sugar induces breast tumor development by altering 12 locks signaling. And yes, from other studies, the role of 12 locks in tumorigenesis has been well established in several types of cancer. Now we don't need to go super deep into acronym land, but we clearly need human studies here. That being said, you know, we have an inkling of a mechanism here. So who knows? So this brings me to this whole topic of indirect causation. Can something be considered a carcinogen if it has a sort of roundabout way that it causes cancer? And I showed you that high blood glucose chart earlier. That was somewhat indirect in its ways. And then we also have this chart for sugar consumption here. We see all these indirect ways that it could happen through obesity, et cetera. And that's one that's worth exploring. I mean, if something causes obesity, when obesity causes cancer, is it a carcinogen? And so maybe high sugar consumption, high calorie consumption could do that. But then we also have to think that even just being sedentary, if you are eating enough calories could lead to obesity, but if you're not eating enough calories, then sedentariness doesn't do that. So we can't just call being sedentary carcinogenic. Though a pretty strong argument probably could be made, but this brings me to the WHO again, because it does appear that there are some indirect ways that carcinogens cause cancer, according to them. For example, that night shift work being a probable carcinogen. I mean, we're talking about indirect circadian rhythm effects, possibly doing it. It's not like there's some direct contact of some substance on some tissue, for example, smoking leading to some carcinogen touching lung cells, causing DNA damage. So it's pretty clear that looking into this, it's a little convoluted. We have a strong indirect relationship, but we have that increased signal for breast cancer. More research is needed, but I'm not in charge of it. If I was, I would probably pin sugar as like a class 2B possible carcinogen for breast cancer only at this stage. You know, we have this extra direct mechanism for that, the 12 locks and who knows what else we will find. But for the other ones, it's just really indirect, just upregulating of perhaps metabolic syndrome or various signaling that like any increase in calorie consumption could lead to an increased risk of cancer. So in the end, I was honestly quite surprised that there wasn't a stronger connection. I was also looking like, did the sugar industry pay for this to be thrown away? Well, it does appear that they buried some heart disease connections that were loose in rat studies back in the 60s. Uh, there doesn't appear to be some cabal here controlling this. We're seeing various results that are pretty consistent from other countries as well. And I was very surprised to find that newer research is showing that no, these tumors aren't really sucking down glucose as much as the narrative is. I don't think that research got a lot of press for some reason, and, or maybe it just wasn't popular. People just wanna keep on hating on sugar. Well, it might actually be the fatty acids or the glutamine of which all of the top 10 main sources are meat and other animal products. And in terms of that breast cancer, I think that range of like no increased risk in some studies to like two and a half times increased risk sort of averages out to there being 
a pretty reasonable concern there, especially for people that might be at an increased risk. And I think that we need more research on this topic. And I wouldn't be surprised if down the line, the WHO comes to some conclusion like that. And not to blow too much smoke up my vegan butt, but uh, I did make a video like just a few months before the WHO deemed meat as a carcinogen, processed meat and red meat saying that meat causes cancer and going over the research. So, you know, you know, maybe I'm ahead of the trend here. Maybe I'm wrong, but it goes without saying that there are just various health benefits of dodging refined sugar anyway. It's just, we might as well take a level-headed look at what scientific claims we can make. And let me know down below what you think about all of this. Was there any research I missed? Do you feel compelled or not compelled by this argument? And as usual, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.